Good morning and can I welcome everyone to the 32nd meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones? As, as meeting papers are provided in digit format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. I welcome Liam MacArthur to the meeting, who is attending for the evidence session on the Fuel Poverty Target Definition and Strategy Scotland Bill. We have received apologies from Annabelle Ewing. The first item of business is a, a welcome to Alec Rowley to the committee. Alec replaces Monica Lennon, who has taken on a different role within her party, and I put on record the committee's thanks to Monica for her hard work as Deputy Convener. I ask Alec to indicate whether he has any relevant interest to declare. Yeah, thank you, Convener. I would refer to my register of interests within the parliamentary okay. register. Thank you very much. Uh, next item, I, following Monica's, uh, Monica Lennon's resignation from the committee, the position of Deputy Convener is now vacant. The Parliament has agreed that only members of the Scottish Labour Party are eligible for nomination as Deputy Convener of this committee, and I invite any nominations for that post. Uh, and I, myself, am happy to uh, nominate Alec Rowley. Do we agree to choose Alec as our Deputy Convener? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And before I go on to the, the third item, the Fuel Poverty Bill with the, the witnesses, can I just put on record my thanks for uh, all those who came to meet us at Lochy Community Hub and Dundee to talk about their experiences of fuel poverty? It's vital that, alongside hearing from experts, such as yourselves, we also hear from those with lived experiences, and we're grateful that so many people took the time to come and meet us with us on Monday. Now, this is the, third, the first day of Stage 1 of the Fuel Poverty Bill, and we will be taking evidence on this bill from now until the end of December, before reporting to the Parliament on the bill early in the new year. And I welcome today's witnesses, Elizabeth Layton, Director, Existing Homes Alliance Scotland, Craig Salter, Policy Officer, Citizens Advice Scotland. Linda Corbett, Energy Advisor, East Ayrshire Citizens Advice Bureau. Norman Kerr, Director, Energy Action Scotland. And Dion Alexander, Chairman Highland and Islands Housing Association, Affordable Warmth Group. I thank you to all of you for your submissions. And we'll go straight to questions from members, beginning with myself. Could you give me your view on the main drivers of fuel poverty and the degree to which each driver contributes to overall fuel poverty rates and levels? Would anybody be want to kick that one off? Mr Kerr. I'll kick off, convener, if I may. Um, we mainly talked about three drivers. Um, the fourth driver is something that we've only really started to consider within the last year, two years. Um, the extent to which that is a contributory factor has not been well measured or defined, although we know um, that behaviour change can reduce bills by around 10%. Um, if you amend how you use appliances, set your heating. So it's a contributory factor. Um, again, in terms of measurement, um, the measurement across Scotland in terms of energy efficiency um, has been drawn from the House Condition Survey and we've seen the levels of energy efficiency rise over a period of time. Um, government statistics, Scottish Government statistics, um, have shown that um, if you increase income, it has a better outcome than increasing energy efficiency in the shorter term. Um, however, um, given that fuel prices continue to increase, um, then we really need to, um, and pardon the pun, insulate homes against rising costs. The more energy efficient the home, the less energy will be used. So it's a, a, a visit. Sir. You're allowed one pun a visit. That's good. Thank you. That, that, I declare my pun then. Um, <laughs> but we, we have that complex interaction. And just because you sort one element doesn't mean the others will fall into line. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to uh, add to that. Greg? Um, yeah, I'd just like, yeah, I'd uh, second what Nori's just said. Um, I th and I think just uh, to give a bit of insight into the impact of behaviour change, we've carried out a lot of research over the last year into the support needs of people in fuel poverty and, in particular, the forms of support that um, people who use, uh, rely on electric heating 
require an electric heating is an area that we know there's very high levels of fuel poverty due to high costs. But one of the things that we see in that is that there are a, a, a lot of people, uh, the way they use their heating has a big impact on their heating bills in that area. So we see a lot of people who have storage heating that don't necessarily know how to use their storage heating. We have a lot of people who have time of use tariffs, uh, dynamically teleswitched tariffs and meters, which they don't necessarily understand, and so they're using their heating at the wrong time. And I think what that perhaps tells us is that the behavior change aspect is complex and can apply quite differently to different circumstances. And so it's definitely an area where I think we need to get more evidence, but it is something that has a big impact on certain groups. Okay, thank you. Elizabeth Lee. Um, yes, we certainly welcome the fact that the strategy is looking at all four drivers of fuel poverty, and we particularly welcome the commitment from government to remove poor energy performance as a driver of fuel poverty. Um, we think that's you know, certainly within the powers of the Scottish government, and it's you know, really high time that we did that was removed as, as a reason, because we can do that. There's no technical um, reason why that's not possible. Um, it's a matter of investment, it's a matter of planning, and as we know, working on the um, behavior chain to, to maximize the impact of whatever measures are put in place. But at the same time, we recognize that there, there has to be work across all the drivers of fuel poverty, and so that's why we've argued that any um, progress reports and measurement and targets should reflect the four drivers, and so there should be reporting on outcomes across the board. Before I bring MD else in, like just something that you talked about there, about some of the drivers. Now, the, the, the Scottish Government obviously has limited powers in some of the areas of, of uh, fuel prices and household incomes, for example. So what do you think uh, uh, of the wisdom of setting a price, uh, a target, fuel poverty target, when they don't have control of all the drivers? Do you I'll, I'll start off. I think um, the Scottish government can, you know, expand the, you know, push the boundaries of its of its powers, which have actually grown in the last few years. There are more powers in the areas of social security. There are um, exploring areas of uh, how they can affect um, price energy prices through support of community energy, or even looking at this publicly owned energy company. So, so there are areas of, of push, as I said, pushing the boundaries, even in areas that are reserved at the moment. Um, but they, we think that they can set this target because targets, ambitious targets, drive innovation, drive investment, provide certainty for um, the supply chain to invest in this area, which again can help drive down prices in the longer run. So we believe that ambitious targets are are achievable and you know after all we you know the one thing i thought to myself to, to to say today is we have to be sure that this bill means that this really is the last generation that will live in fuel poverty in scotland it really is if we can't walk away from you know this session or or with a bill confident that that's what we're setting out to achieve you know then we then we failed okay thank you uh, linda corbett then yeah, I would just um, like to say about the, the fuel prices, um, at Citizens Advice, we very much welcome the cap on the charges for prepay customers and additionally the safeguard tariff that's being rolled out, particularly for those in the priority services register. I think, however, it is still falling short of the mark and could actually be a very useful tool in helping pull people out of fuel poverty. At the moment, if you're on the priority services register, we're mostly looking at vulnerabilities uh, in relation to health conditions. However, I think those who are financially vulnerable, who without necessarily having health conditions, are uh, we're doing them a disservice by not allowing them to be included in that priority service register, which again, is, as I say, opens up access to the safeguard tariff. So I think there is definitely work to be done there and our understanding and definitions of vulnerability and not just looking at health, not just looking at age and also looking at how quickly people can move from one state of vulnerability to another and how that can actually compound their experience of fuel poverty. Okay, thank you. Mr Kerr, you uh, wanted to come in? Thanks, Convener. Um, I think there's a couple of things. Um, the Scottish Government are um, now taking more powers over social security and indeed, while not energy price, 
um, the energy company obligation. Um, and through that, um, the Warm Home Discount Scheme, um, Warm Home Discount um, is there for Scottish Government to um, administer and could change. So, for example, in a remote and rural area, they may want to lift the level um, of the uh, element that's applied and reduce that in a urban area. So we still have the same amount of money. So there, is, there can be a recognition that in certain parts of Scotland it is more difficult to eat your home. The second part um, is not something that's particularly new, um, but through the social security powers in the mid-80s, there was an acknowledgement that certain house types, um, and some members may be familiar with bits of Glasgow, in particular the Barfield Estate, um, the Barfield Estate was designated as a hard-to-heat estate, and everybody within that estate, um, through their social security payments, um, received an uplift per week over the winter season. So again, using social security powers, there can be recognition that to mitigate against uh, fuel prices in winter, additional payments can be made. So while all of the drivers um, may not have or the Scottish Government may not have access to all of the drivers, it has access to some that would certainly uh, help me against fuel costs in particular. OK, thank you very much. Mr Alexander. Um, responding, Chair, to the wisdom of fuel poverty targets, um, just uh, one um, specific on that. Uh, we, in our submission, uh, think it would be helpful to continue to um, measure extreme fuel poverty. At the moment, we have basic fuel poverty, which is under the old definition, 10% um, of income, as you know, and extreme fuel poverty is twice or more. And uh, we in our submissions uh, say, please keep the extreme fuel poverty because it will actually give you a guide to what's going on in terms of eliminating the worst forms of fuel poverty. And we say very firmly, extreme fuel poverty is intolerable in a civilised society and that it should be got rid of as quickly as possible. We're saying basically within five years. Um, and um, as for the main target, uh, we're saying, if you could, yes, we completely take the point that not all the drivers are within the powers of Scottish Government, but that nevertheless, we think it should be possible to reduce the level to about 5%. I think that you're always going to have people popping in and out of fuel poverty, no matter where you get to. So 5% is uh, a not unreasonable figure, we feel, for basic fuel poverty. Going back to the main drivers of fuel poverty, um, um, I imagine that we will be discussing in a bit more detail the question which we have raised in the rural and remote rural context relating to the level of disposable income, the level of disposable income, and why the, the definition needs to reflect that properly in relation to remote rural areas through the minimum income standard, um, which we support. Um, and, you know, a driver of fuel poverty is the lack of trusted local support in some areas, particularly remote rural areas. And it's quite um, revealing to look at, for example, at the map which was produced of the heaps, abs, successes and otherwise for 2015-16 produced by Scottish Government. And it shows some surprising gaps in areas uh, where you would expect there to have been high activity. Um, and this uh, lack of trusted local support is not to say that where it exists it isn't absolutely excellent and that there aren't good national services which are helpful, but what works best in solving the problems in remote rural areas is having people available to go into people's homes who would not otherwise think necessarily that they deserved any help or t at all, the old lady living in a croft house at the end of a lane somewhere. And uh, uh, I hear so many uh, of these examples quoted where that has made such a difference. And that begs the question of the lack of reliable funding to maintain the trusted support, because there's a lot of hand-to-mouth going on here in terms of people looking around for funding. And I think an effective uh, new fuel poverty strategy should be thinking very seriously about the public funding commitment to make sure that the outreaches, the proper outreaches, is provided in the areas where it is most needed. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Graham, you wanted to come in at the back or something? Um, yes, um, I've, I've got a couple of questions. Before I get to them, um, I just want to ask um, Lin Linda something as a follow-up. Um, uh, and it, you, you mentioned the safeguard tariff. Um, as the convener said, um, three of us uh, visited Dundee um, this week, um, and we met a lot of people who um, pre prepay for, for their electricity and her electricity and gas, and we heard about the issues around that. Um, I just wonder if you can tell us what, what the safeguard tariff is. Uh, it's a, a tariff that's set for credit customers, um, so prepay is slightly different. There's a sort of cap in the maximum amount that can be charged per unit of gas and electricity. The safeguard tariff is essentially the same, but for those on a, a credit meter as opposed to the prepay meter. Right, OK, that's useful. Um, right, so getting um, in, into the bill, um, a couple of things. They're, bo they're both linked so you can answer it in that in the linked way if you like um, we've got a five percent target so if you can tell us what you think of that should that be more ambitious and the five percent target has to be achieved by 2040 now most of you in your evidence think fact, think all of you in your evidence um, say that's not ambitious enough it's 22 years away um, so I think the two things are linked. So if you could tell us what you think of the 5% target and that 2040 date. Um, yes, in our, our evidence, um, we've come out very strongly in favour of a much more ambitious target. As I said earlier, you know, this bill should ensure that it is the last generation living in, in fuel poverty. And so we've called for a target that would be um, move the date forward by 2032, that aligns with some of the work being done on the climate cha uh, climate change bill and climate change plan, and and also that the target should be down to eradicate to 0% zero, zero as far as reasonably practicable. So we are acknowledging that there are people that move in and out of fuel poverty and that you may not be able to get it down to an absolute zero. There will be cases where at particular times that's that's not possible. Uh, and, and we think that is a, a reasonable position. It is achievable um, and so a, a credible target to have and something that we should be striving for. I also support what um, Di Al Alexander was saying is that there should be continuing to measure uh, the levels of extreme fuel poverty or we may be able to look for examples from the child poverty bill where they speak about persistent poverty. So, so we're making sure that the risk is, is if you say allow for this 5%, that that 5% indeed are the most difficult, the hardest to reach, the most expensive um, to reach, and that they, they just get left behind. And I think we cannot be in a position where we would say it's okay for that 5% to continue to live in fuel poverty in 2040. You know, surely that's unacceptable. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'd agree with what Elizabeth's just said. Um, we understand the logic of the 5%. As Di said, it's, you know, there is a transient element to fuel poverty, but that, uh, if, if that is the target that's met, then there has to be a commitment to an ambition that work is then ongoing or even stepped up to reduce it to zero. And that 5%, that, that if that is 5% who are hard to reach or have a, a, a greater support need, then more resource has to be uh, uh, put towards supporting them. In terms of the date, uh, we would agree 2040 is too far in the future. It would mean a reduction of 1% per year, which doesn't reflect uh, the, the progress we've seen in recent, le recent years. And it would mean, as you say, 22 years uh, in the future. We, uh, we, so we would also support a target of 2032. That would also bring it in line with some of the ambitions set out around energy efficiency, around uh, improving the energy efficiency of social housing um, and uh, improving general energy efficiency standards. And I think one of the things that relates to the previous question around the four drivers of fuel poverty is that if we have a target to essentially, you know, for all intents and purposes, remove 
energy efficiency as a driver of fuel poverty that is around 2032. And then eight years later, we have a target to completely eradicate fuel poverty. We have, we, we have a risk that there's a focus, as there has to an extent been in the past, uh, an undue focus on energy efficiency alone, and that the other drivers of fuel poverty are, in effect, left until later. And so what we're saying is because, as has been pointed out already, all of those drivers of fuel poverty, they interact, they all have a significant impact, and as a result, I think they all need to be addressed together. So if we're saying we can achieve that, those improvements in energy efficiency by 2032, then work should be ongoing alongside that to bring all of those other drivers down as well. So I think in that regard, 2032 is a, an achievable target. Thank you. Mr Kerr, you wanted to come in and then... Um, if we look at the levels of fuel poverty in 2016, um, we had 27%. If you apply the proposed new definition to that, that brings that down to 26%, uh, 24%, sorry. So there's a 3% drop by changing the definition. Um, given that that's a 2016 target, um, what we are talking about, if we take 5% off a 24%, um, is a 19% reduction or a 19% out of people out in fuel poverty. By a 20-year programme that starts in 2020, that's less than a 1% improvement every year. Um, and our view is that is certainly not ambitious. That's business as usual um, that would, would achieve that if we're going to continue to um, review how we measure uh, people with unfueled poverty. Because the Scottish House Condition Survey has already changed its methodology three times in 2011, 2014 and 2016. So we continue to change the methodology, and in each of those cases, we've seen fuel poverty drop. And our worry is that we continue to make changes that will actually not mean anything other than we're not providing support, enough support to homes, but we can manage down the levels of fuel poverty by continuing to change uh, and manipulate the data that we collect. Yeah, I'd just like to reflect some of the comments of the, the panel, I would agree with the 5% the and with the 2032, but again with a secondary target stretching to 2040, um, particularly because I would like to see fuel poverty strategies being embedded and uh, not simply removed once a target is reached. It must be an ongoing thing. I think particularly when we do have the rural and outlying areas, you know, they're very small communities. They learn from <coughs> each other. Behaviours are a learned thing. And we'd like to see um, fuel poverty strategies in, in, into education, um, looking at um, how we can support young people to understand energy efficiency, how to behave in an energy efficient way, and actually, rather than removing them from fuel, fuel poverty or their you know, their future homes from fuel poverty, avoiding them getting into fuel poverty in the first place. So uh, I welcome the, the 2040 um, target, but with a bit more ambition, uh, uh, as Craig had said, and Nori, um, 2032 would probably be more realistic. I think as well, you know, Nori, you said about the 19%. I think by the time we come to 2020, it's going to be a lot more than a 19% reduction. I think the 24% fuel poverty target, um, sorry, percentage has been quite skewed by the um, massive fluctuations situations in energy prices, particularly the drop that we had around about the time that the House Concession Survey was done. Obviously, we've had massive increases again since then, particularly with standing charges. So we'd expect actually there's going to be a bit more work to do than the 19%. Okay, thank you. Alexander. Uh, <coughs> Chair, um, we too support the um, a programme of 14 years. It, it uh, matches the one that um, Parliament instigated in 2001-2. Um, which came to its termination in 2016. So see no good reason for it to be any longer uh, than that period. Um, the uh, target, I've already made reference to the uh, extreme uh, fuel poverty uh, and the, 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 the good grounds we believe for there being a target on that as well and eliminating that pronto. Um, I think that the point I would make with my Highlands and Islands uh, hat on is that in the Highlands and Islands, the Scottish House Condition Survey statistics for local authorities show that 50% of all households, a half of all households under the existing 
so-called old definition are in fuel poverty uh, and that therefore there is there really has to be a concerted attempt to recognize the these places that have the highest levels of fuel poverty the difficulties that, that have been faced in eliminating fuel poverty in these areas which has effectively been flatlining for years and suggest that another and new and better approach is needed to make sure that the target is reached in those areas. Okay, very briefly, Mr. Kirk, is Mr. Simpson wants to come back. Um, thanks, Convener. I would just to come back. Um, Mr. Simpson um, spoke about the safeguard tariff at the start. <coughs> um, I think you need to bear in mind that this is a temporary measure. Um, the worry that we have on both the safeguard tariff and the prepayment uh, tariff caps is that it in some way will amend household behaviour in the wrong direction. In other words, people think that the government is protecting them by applying a cap. They are less likely to switch supplier or shop around for a better deal um, or change their payment method. Um, so it's a short term measure and even Ofgem admit that they are not sure of the impact on switching rates. And if we want people to find better deals and lower prices, then we've got to recognise that any tariff cap can only be a temporary measure and we must continue to work and support householders to view what their energy bill is and how they can reduce that and not simply sit back and think that they are protected when they may already be paying far too much. Thank you very much, Mr Simpson. You wanted to go back in? Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks, convener. Um, I just want to um, come back to you uh, all on, on the 20, 2040. Um, it, I mean, it's a long way away, but in, in, in the policy uh, memorandum, the government says that to achieve that uh, will involve the use of uh, low co cost-effective low-carbon heating. And as you all know, most homes don't have that. So to, to roll that out nationwide will be a, a, a massive project, um, which is presumably why they've picked 2040. So would you not think that's reasonable under those circumstances? And if you don't think it's reasonable, I know you're itching to come in, Mr Kerr. Um, if you don't think it's reasonable, you've all said it should be 2032. Now, either that's plucked out of thin air or it's based on something. So per perhaps you can explain where you've got 2032 from um, and, wh and why the government is... Why, why is the government wrong when it's going to take a, an awful lot of work to, to get all homes onto um, low carbon heating? We start to respond. Can, can I ask you to keep your answers a bit shorter because we've got a lot to get through and we've got another hour to get through it in. So. Uh, Mr Kerr, you are the keenest. Yes, um, I think we don't necessarily need to put low carbon heat and fuel poverty together. Um, that in itself a low carbon heat source will not solve fuel poverty. The electricity grid in Scotland just now is mainly low carbon. Um, we will have our gas grid for many, many years to come. We will not replace that, but we are um, looking towards technologies that reduce the amount of carbon in the gas mix that we have. So, for example, biofuels um, and, and a range of other mixes that we put in hydrogen that will reduce that but simply by giving someone low carbon uh, heat does not take away um, the fact that they will be, be fuel poor it may actually contribute um, to their fuel poverty if the technology applied to gain that low carbon heat so for example stripping out completely the gas <coughs> grid and moving to electricity for heating alone the additional cost of that um, is very, very significant. As for the 2040 target, um, this is about scaling up ambition. Um, we could all certainly say 2040 sounds absolutely fine, um, but that doesn't give any step change in the productivity levels or the number of homes um, tackled each year. And it does, in all honesty, condemn another generation to live in fuel poverty. So the 2032 target is set in terms of what can we reasonably expect um, in a number of parliamentary terms and an increase in the level of budget 
Um, that expenditure's got to come, and I'm sorry, Convener Manser is exceptionally longer than you had hoped. Um, but if we maintain the budget at its current levels, then that's what we will get. Some time ago, Energy Action Scotland talked about um, a need for £200 million a year. That's a very, very old figure. We've never achieved that level of expenditure, ever. Um, so we're way, way behind. We need to significantly raise our game. Right, thank you very much. Um, I'll move on. Uh, Alexander, you've got a question to ask. There's been lots of discussion, and you've touched on it already this morning, about the new definition. Uh, so can I ask the, the panel's views on the new definition? Uh, do you believe it is an improvement, or is it not an improvement? And if it is an improvement, why is it an improvement? And if it's not an improvement, why is it not an improvement? Mr Alexander. Um, from the, um, it's a bit like a curate's egg to answer your <laughs> question, in that it is good in parts, but but not in others. Um, um, I mean, as, you, we welcome the fact that we've got this fuel poverty bill going forward, and we are more than happy to see a re-examination of the definition. Uh, because the definition should logically underpin everything which flows from it in terms of um, um, giving the evidence base to show what is happening uh, across the board in relation to fuel poverty uh, and therefore uh, enable the proper evidence-based um, development of program, policies and programmes to address the problems and achieve the elimination all but of fuel poverty in a way which previous fuel poverty strategies have failed to do. Uh, but in the rural context, and we welcome the fact that the minimum income standard is being used to underpin, to inform the understanding, the evidence-based understanding of poverty, uh, the amount of disposable income that people have available to them. But where it falls down, and falls down very badly, and undermines the whole approach radically, as far as we in the Highlands and uh, many other organisations have been making exactly the same point, is in the context of um, the not using all the available minimum income standard evidence. Um, and, uh, as you are aware, there is evidence which has been gathered on exactly the same basis, effectively, as the, the minimum income standard UK data uh, for remote rural Scotland. It was first gathered in 2013, it was refreshed in 2016. And we're saying, please, please use this evidence. And the independent panel of academics who came up with a new fuel poverty definition themselves recognised there was a particular problem in remote rural areas of Scotland and suggested an uplift um, to, uh, in the same way, for example, we have a London uplift on the, on the MIS UK data um, um, uh, when it's in, used to inform the living wage, for example. We're saying, please, please do the same thing for remote rural Scotland, because we know from the MIS remote rural Scotland data that depending on the household type and the location, that f uh, families need between 10 and 35 percent more income to s achieve the same basic level of income. That has to be a fundamental contributor to f fuel poverty which follows from that. It's not the only contributor, but it must be recognised in any definition if it is to have the credibility and to be to serve the uh, purpose for which it is designed, I believe. Thank you. You want to come in, Craig? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, just to uh, to build on what Dai has just said, uh, I think Dai is absolutely right. The minimum income. I mean, we we support the the new definition with the exception that the minimum income standard for remote rural areas has to be included. Uh, our research has backed up a lot of what organisations like Highlands and Islands Enterprise have come out with. That you know, that, as Dai says, ten to forty percent higher incomes required. Last year, CAS um, commissioned some research, some qualitative research with households that were fuel poor, defined as being fuel poor, into their support needs. 
And one of the interesting things that came out of that was that the groups who self-identified as having a significant need for fuel poverty support corresponded quite closely uh, with the groups that were more likely to be defined as fuel poor under the Scottish Government's impact assessment based on the new definition, with one exception, and that exception was households in rural areas. And households in remote rural areas particularly said they needed uh, all, all sorts of support, advice and uh, financial support. Uh, and the fact that that was the one group that didn't correspond with uh, what was in the impact assessment would suggest to me that this is the one area that there's a real need for a sort of fundamental change. Do you believe that, that having that change will progress it? If that change is not put into the process, uh, then it will be flawed uh, and it will ensure that individuals are not being captured uh, in, in the locations that you've identified that are in the rural or in the, uh, the more remote and the harder uh, to, to ascertain. So without that uh, new definition being encapsulated, the new definition is going to be flawed. I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kenny, then Andy's got a number yeah, of questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Kevin. There's so much to ask. I'm going to not obviously um, you, you ask lo all, all the questions that I would like to because of time. But first of all, I'd like to support the, the position on the minimum income standards. I mean, representing over 6,000 island constituents. I'm just wondering on that point, would it, d d does the panel believe that when we, when we look to tackle fuel poverty, there should be additional emphasis on island and rural communities to bring them down, if you like, to the proportion of people in a given in a local authority an average local authority area that suffer from pure poverty rather than have a situation whereby one local authority you might have ten percent or fifteen percent but in, in some of the highland and remote authorities you might have thirty or forty percent. Do you think there should be a specific focus initially um on and getting get additional resources put to that to, to reduce that to at least the Scottish average initially? Would people support such a measure? Yeah, I would just like to make a very general comment. In East Ayrshire, we're not remote rural, but we certainly have some rural areas, and particularly we do see difficulties with access to support services. Um, one of the main ones is access to finances in order to travel, and then the second is obviously access to the transport to make the journey to reach the support services. So these people do very often end up living in isolation. They look to neighbours, they look to friends, they look to family for support, but those tend to be in the exact same position. So I think we do need something within the strategy that identifies those those people in those groups of society as potentially needing extra support. Thank, thanks very much for that. And just, just moving on, I mean, just... Uh, uh, some of the answers I've received, I mean, Elizabeth Layton, you talked about, you know... Um, about about the as other people have pondered about the Scottish government needing to be more ambitious, and you talk but but the Scottish government does not actually have much control over incomes. For example, pensions an obvious one that we don't have any control of. For example, and and um, the a Scottish government, even if it set up its own energy company, would still be subject to, for example, world prices. So, if it, um, even if it was to you know sell its fuel at cost, we. So how realistic is it to reduce fuel poverty year on year? Because the, the, it, it wasn't uh, under um, successful in the previous strategy. When we, when we, when the Scottish government, despite its best efforts, still is buffeted by these external uh, factors. And one thing I would say to the panel is, you're all talking about the Scottish government only wanting to reduce uh, fuel, or only aiming to reduce fuel poverty by one percent a year. But if we reduce the number. Uh, from 600,000 to 140,000, that's a 77 per cent reduction that's being planned from the number of people in fuel poverty at the moment, which is, which is more like 4 per cent a year, I would suggest. Uh, the <coughs> question in, in terms of ambition, uh, I, while I certainly commend the fact that the Scottish Government has such a strong commitment, and indeed this Parliament, to the eradication of fuel poverty, and, and has over the years had a, had a series of programs to address that, mainly focusing on energy efficiency. However, uh, one would argue that, you know, let's learn from the lessons that, you know, why hasn't it reduced as much as it should have done? And, you know, let's learn from evaluation of programs, which hasn't, hasn't been done until fairly recently. And, and looking at how forming of the types of partnerships that they're looking at, in, in the strategy could make these programs more effective, how greater investment, yes, it does come down to you know, numbers in the budget of greater investment in 
not just the delivery of measures, but the before and after care of, of helping people to understand how to manage their energy more effectively, how to do switching, all of that. It, re it will require greater investment if we seriously want to eradicate fuel poverty. And so I think you know, we, we have to, as Nori was saying, we have to up our game. We have to, you know, it requires a step change. If we're going to go along at a business as usual budget, a business as usual strategy, then we'll have business as usual results. And, and I think, you know, the whole point of this bill and the strategy following on the work of the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force and the Strategic Working Group is to change, is to build on what we've been doing and improve. To, to follow on from that, I think you, 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 I mean, your submission, like all the others, is actually excellent. And you, what you've said is that uh, you note the positive results from research undertaken by Energy Agency and NHS Air Shanan, which is my own area, where preliminary analysis of the health impacts of area-based solid wall insulation schemes suggest lower hospital admission rates for respiratory and cardiovascular-related conditions in these areas compared with the control group, not in the scheme. So I'm just wondering, I mean, have you had any, have you had specific uh, discussions with Scottish ministers, for example, about how? Uh, switch, for example, of some NHS resources into fuel poverty reduction, because you're suggesting a budget increase of 110 to 234 million, which on the face of it looks quite ambitious and, and uh, you know, on a year-to-year -year basis. But if you look at how you could perhaps save NHS money by can putting money into this, and I know this is something Norrie's talked about for a number of years as well. Have you, have you, had, get, have you had any kind of uh, discussions, any uh, positive response from ministers on that kind of issue? Is that something that's been considered? How, how do you... How is it it is certainly something that we have raised in, in terms of that, you know, should we be looking more globally at, at the budget and not just at a, you know, it shouldn't just be in the housing um, division. We should uh -huh. be looking broader of, you know, where, where are the other benefits coming from? Who else should be investing in this? And it goes beyond health, of course. It goes to economy because of all the jobs that, uh -huh. that could be created and sustained through a, an ambitious program. Um, that in, just in terms of the energy efficiency side. But you're right, we're now starting to see hard evidence of the health benefits, and, and Ayrshire and Aaron have been a real leader working um, with the energy agency to, to demonstrate that. And we, we need more of that evidence, that, that evaluation done, so that we can actually cost what those benefits are to the NHS. But previous research has indicated it would be up to 80 million a year, just savings to the NHS, let alone the, the health and well-being benefits to individuals. And so, so we think that that's why we were so disappointed in um, the financial memorandum, because it fails to look at the issues of cost of reaching the target, whether it be a even if it's just a 5% by 2040 or, or true eradication of fuel poverty, you know, what is the cost of that and how are we going to meet that cost with public investment but also some private investment coming in through other, other policies, we're looking at other po portfolios of, of the government. But we're disappointed that the um, Finance Committee apparently is not going to report on the financial memorandum, but that's one of the questions we think they should look at, not just the amount of the budget, but where does it come from. So just lastly, actually, uh, thanks, convener, for your indulgence. You've said again in your submission, and uh, I'm sorry I'm focused on one individual, but, it's, but um, I just want to discuss this one point. It says, you said the Scottish Government has stated in the draft fuel poverty strategy it will develop, if appropriate, a wider energy-efficient Scotland bill for later in this Parliament, and this would be the vehicle for any further legislative change needed to support energy-efficient Scotland beyond the fuel poverty provisions contained in this bill. I, I, do you feel, and other members of the panel, that perhaps this is a missed opportunity and there should be a much more rounded bill instead of looking to have, for example, maybe another bill a year or two from now, everything should be contained effectively in one bill, and would you like to see additional provisions in this bill, if possible? Well, this this bill, we feel, has had its genesis, really, as a, as a warm homes bill, and it was speaking about warm homes for everybody in Scotland, warm, low-carbon, affordable homes. Um, and so, yes, we were disappointed when a decision was taken to make this just focus on fuel poverty. Well, you know, we welcome the focus, but um, we feel it is limited and misses out that opportunity to support it with, by providing a complementary statutory underpinning for the Energy Efficient Scotland program, which we think is, is very much needed to, again, to provide that ambition to deliver on uh, removing poor energy performance as a driver of fuel poverty. And so we know that there is a consideration of a possible Energy Efficient Scotland bill. Perhaps we'll hear more about that when I believe the Minister is going to make a statement 
to Parliament on Thursday. So that would be very positive if there was a firm commitment to that bill and what it would contain. But failing that, I think this bill provides a perfect opportunity to take this forward in a timely fashion, in a way that would support achievement of the targets in the Fuel Poverty Bill. Uh, I'm going to move on. And uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Convener. Just on that uh, last point, um, we will also have evidence from the Energy Poverty Research Initiative and Common Wheel saying they're disappointed that the Scottish Government has chosen to ignore the consensus in the expert workshop in 2017 that the finalisation of the new definition should be postponed for two or three years to allow the definition and inclusion of a robust Scottish definition of vulnerability in the new definition of fuel poverty. So we're having a bit of conflicting evidence, um, but we'll, that, that's what we need to deal with. Um, I just want to ask... Um, the panel, I mean, Di Alexander, you said that the definition should underpin everything that will flow from it. It should be the evidence base um, for presumably the strategy and the implementation and the delivery um, of the target. I mean, I've just got a sort of general question about, you know, how we go about measuring fuel poverty, because it comes from the Scottish House Conditions Survey. Uh, it's a modelling uh, exercise, and as far as I can see, it measures fuel poverty by local authority area. And we have a map in the SPICE briefing mm -hmm. showing that. You were asking for um, uh, an uplift to the minimum income standard in relationship to remote and rural uh, Scotland. I think you also mentioned in your submission a better alignment with the urban-rural classification. So my question is, first of all, how well can the current measurements of fuel poverty align with the geography of Scotland? And secondly, if the bill is passed, uh, as it stands, will it actually help to prioritise and plan where and how we're going to spend money? Right. Um, how do, well, first of all, does it um, align with geography of Scotland? Um, I think that it, uh, it could do better particularly in relation to the way that information is gathered according to the Scottish Government's urban rural classification system, which, as you know, is based on, uh, it's, it's called the six-fold uh, classification system, and category one is effectively the cities, and then you work down one and two effectively the cities, three and four are effectively towns, and then uh, five and six are effectively rural. That is to say, they are settlements of 3,000 or less, and category five is whether they are within half an hour's drive time of a major conurbation, and category six is, rem is effectively remote rural, which is more than half an hour's drive time from a major conurbation. And although information is gathered uh, to some extent, on um, uh, the two categories, it's very often, and, and it has been the case in relation to uh, a degree with the fuel poverty uh, information which is gathered, uh, it's globalised up. So you just look at rural and you say that um, uh, rural being categories five and six, so it's aggregated. We're saying, please, henceforth going forward, make sure that all information is gathered on the basis of, so that you can see clearly what is happening in both category five and category six. In other words, accessible rural and remote rural. Remote rural is, it's commonly recognized, not least by the independent panel of academics who came up with the new definition. Um, remote rural is where the greatest problems are. And um, you um, need to be have a much better understanding of outcomes. The point has been made already by my colleagues here uh, about the importance of measuring outcomes. Um, an awful lot of assumptions are made on the basis of inputs. That is to say, energy efficiency inputs necessarily equating to affordable warmth outcomes. That isn't the case. Experience shows that too often an energy efficiency input doesn't necessarily mean that the person living in the house actually ends up uh, achieving the, uh, the warmth at a price which they can afford and they still have a problem. So we need an improved system also 
uh, to complement the, the much better understanding of what's going on in remote rural Scotland as well as accessible rural Scotland of the outcomes. Um, and I hope that the new fuel poverty strategy will take that question very seriously indeed so that we can, going forward, have a much better understanding of what works and what doesn't work. And I think that's been one of the major weaknesses of the fuel poverty strategy um, previously is that it, 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 it is, hasn't looked nearly closely enough at real outcomes in terms of affordable warmth. And forgive me, uh, I've forgotten the second part of your question. No, so, so the second part of my question is, and others can come in. So, for example, if I'm a policymaker in five years' time, I'm in the Scottish Government, and uh, I want to eradicate fuel poverty on the island of Skye, yeah. am I in a better position to do that after this bill is enacted than I am today? Right. Well, that is about um, not unless you uh, also take the... Uh, 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 unless you really think hard about it from the perspective of the people who need the help and, and what kind of help works best for them. And the experience of the, um, wherever I've come across it, but I mean in particular the, the, the place that I know best, which is the Highlands and Islands, and the um, people who are engaged in the front line trying to tackle the problems, like, for example, La Couch and Sky Housing Association's Energy Advice Service, is that where you have a skilled, um, trusted um, uh, fuel poverty alleviation persons based in the community who uh, are able to um, uh, find the... Uh, make sure that they don't miss anybody out and a lot of this is um, building trust and then word of mouth and then actually getting into the house and looking at all the aspects all those things which are which are causing that household to have difficulty whether it be the the fabric of the property needs improvement insulation whether it be the heating system needs changing whether it be the electricity tariff which of course is a feature of remote rural areas which are essentially off gas um, and the uh, way that they are using the system and the hand-holding support that they may need particularly if they're elderly and very independent minded um, and um, simply don't understand the way that what the system has to offer them the way you do provide that service then you can actually um, uh, with the mix of technical and what you might call um, social work approach almost I don't mean to say that in any demeaning way but people do need a, a lot of hand holding in some instances that that works that's the way to get to uh, grips with the problem now that requires resourcing it requires revenue funding for individuals to make sure that that outreach that effective outreach actually takes place and where it does take place it works extremely well self won't make a difference to that. It's about how we implement things on the ground. Yes, I, 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 that's right. I mean, clearly there is... Um, sorry. Uh, okay, yeah. that, 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 that's, that, that's fine. Yeah. Um, just... Sorry, okay, I wanted to come yeah. in. Sorry, I think that, that you talked about the measurement. Um, Scottish House Condition Survey um, uses Breed M12. Um, Breed M12 has a number of anomalies in it. For example, in calculating fuel costs, it uses a Scottish average for oil. Oil prices in remote and rural are very, very different from inner city oil. So you've got an average there. Um, I would suggest that if we're really going to have the House Condition Survey as our main touchstone, then we need to amend BREEDEM um, to take into account a number of those issues. But at the same time, you're right, it gives it to local authority area and that's quite difficult in say the highlands when it's such a, a huge area but you can apply additional work that will get good figures using proxies and we will always use proxies down to ward level within certain areas that that requires ad additional work so the bill itself won't make targeting resources um, to fuel poor households any easier the minister when he talked about introducing the bill, was looking for a doorstep 
tool that someone on the doorstep could make an assessment of fuel poverty. Given the complexity of the definition, that doorstep tool is nigh on impossible um, to take into account somebody's income, somebody's um, fuel costs, then work out the MIS. So a doorstep tool for an individual house is, is really a non-starter. But we can amend breed M, we can do additional work um, and, and move it down to ward level that would be more useful for local authorities. And they come back okay, in, in it'd, it'd be grateful if you could talk. maybe come back to the committee with some further thoughts in writing about what that would involve. That would be uh, quite useful. Certainly. Um, yeah, a slightly more general point, although I'd, I'd agree with that, but I think there's also something to be said around how you use the definition uh, in terms of budgeting. And obviously, if we have a, a, a more accurate definition, then that could play a role in um, aligning fuel poverty budgets. Obviously, that's a very general point, but how you do that more effectively with the new definition compared to the old one, that's, you know, there's, there's maybe nothing in the bill right now that would say that would make that easier. And so I think one of the uh, one solution for that could be uh, maybe more of a, a more in-depth reporting um, requirement for either a third party or for ministers to report on the impact uh, of each individual driver of fuel poverty, as well as the impact of uh, measures to address those drivers individually to understand where uh, where that money needs to be spent, essentially. So if, if we see that uh, you, you know uh, energy prices are holding back progress, then we know that that's where money needs to go for innovation. So I suppose that's a more general point, but I think there is a role that a more accurate and more detailed definition can play in terms of budgeting. Okay, I think we're going to come back to reporting and accountability, so I'll leave it there, convener. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Liam, you had a couple of questions on that. Just on the... Uh, thanks very much, uh, convener. Yes, indeed. I'd, I'd, as somebody who represents... Uh, the dubious honour of representing uh, the part of the country, um, Orkney, with the highest levels of fuel poverty, um, this is a, a, a particular interest uh, for me. And, and can I congratulate the panel on um, the distinction of... of clearly uh, uh, having compelling enough evidence that the, the government saw fit to issue its retaliation uh, uh, first in terms of explanatory note. But even in that note, um, the government appears to accept that the combined impact of the redefinition targets is a greater reduction in the fuel poverty rate in rural areas compared to urban areas. Now, we've heard from all of you the, the concerns about um, the, the absence of the uh, rural MIS. Um, that this goes against the advice of the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force, against the, the advice of the independent panel, against the wishes, I think, of pretty much every organisation involved in housing and fuel poverty across the Highlands and Islands. And that appears to be based from the note on the potential costs of including uh, a rural MIS and delays in implementing um, the system. So I would be interested in the panel's response to those those two concerns that appear to be being raised by the government to justify um, uh, its position in relation to, to this issue? Um, I mean, the figure that is quoted in the paper which was tabled um, is of it costing half a million pounds uh, over four years. Um, I mean, um, from my conversations with Professor Donald Hirsch, of Loughborough University, who is the person, the key person responsible for the minim, minimum, gathering minimum income standard data, uh, uh, and um, uh, led the work um, uh, on MIS Remote Rural, um, he, 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 I think, is surprised that it should would need to cost that much. Uh, but I mean, the only way I would respectfully suggest that the committee could bottom that out would be to perhaps invite Professor Donald Hirsch uh, to come and give evidence uh, and discuss that very thing. Uh, so it begs the question as to whether it would be money well spent. Um, our view is that it would. Um, the half a million pounds over four years um, if we amend Breedem, and again there's a reference that Breedem needs to be amended, 
that won't be free. There's no cost in for amending Breedem. Um, I think this is um, a, a figure to say why we shouldn't do it and why not why we should. Um, half a million pounds over four years um, is, in the great scheme of things, a fairly small drop in the ocean when we're getting more accurate reporting and being able to dedicate resources more accurately into a particular area. So I'm sorry, I think it's a smoke screen. And his evidence suggests that such a variation would be feasible with a modest amount of ongoing research to keep it up to date. So it doesn't quantify it, but it does kind of suggest it's, it, it's of that order of magnitude. But I mean, it would, Mr. Salter, you earlier were talking about the budgeting aspect. Would you agree that if you don't get the criteria right, um, then where you're directing the resources thereafter isn't going to be most efficiently done? Absolutely. Um, I mean, as I said, I. You know, I can't comment on the exact figure that the Scottish government's <coughs> put on this, but as Norrie and I have both said, that in order to get the outcomes that this bill is trying to achieve, if you if you start from the the wrong point, if you then you're not going to be able to budget uh, in an effective way, and you're not going to get those outcomes. So I'd absolutely agree, it it would be money well spent if it means that the fuel poverty support, if it ultimately means that fuel poverty support is getting to those in the greatest need, um, and in particular those who historically have uh, perhaps found it harder to access support, then absolutely I'd say that was money well spent. And on the point of the, the delay, I mean we've touched on the cost, on, on the delay, do you envisage um, a, 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 a delay given all you've said about the need to crack on with this and, and be more ambitious in terms of the targets? Uh, I think as far as, uh, I've, again, um, I haven't seen any uh, great detail from the Scottish Government on exactly what that delay would be and exactly what would cause it. As far as I'm aware, and as Di has said, a lot of this work has already been done. Uh, Mr Hirsch, as, as well as Highlands and Islands and Enterprise, have done extensive research on what this would include. And we know that these uh, exceptions, these uplifts, already exist in other parts of the country, in London, for example. And so... We, I, uh, it would appear to me that this shouldn't be uh, an insurmountable problem. Even if it, there was to be a delay, as Norrie's rightly pointed out, the, the, the Scottish Government, or in the, the Scottish House Condition Survey, methodologies are applied, are revised and applied retroactively now. So even if there was some short delay, there's no reason that this rural, uh, remote rural uplift shouldn't then be applied once it's ready. So I, I, I don't see that as a, a reason not to do it. Thank you. Right, okay, thank you very much. Um, Alec, you've got a number of questions. Yes. Could I, could I um, turn to the draft strategy that, that was published alongside the, the draft bill, really to try and seek your views on, on firstly, that, that principle of, of having a strategy, um, the timetable in terms of it come out probably 19, certainly after the bill was approved, uh, and what your thoughts are in terms of the, strat the draft strategy as it stands just now. Uh, can, uh, we, can we make our answers as brief as we possibly can, please? I'll make a start. That the strategy, I think, needs to be in place. The question we've got is whether or not lessons have been learned from the previous schemes that will impact on, on the strategy um, just now. Um, and I think, we, again, the strategy is more focused on removing poor energy efficiency as the main driver. We'd like to see a lot more built in there for the support services, such as Citizens Advice, who are doing the, the hand-holding. So it's important we've got a strategy, but I don't think it's wide enough. Very narrow-focused. Alexander. Um, I'm... Um I think that what has been said already about the strategy is, um, uh, you know, I've got, uh, in our submission, we do spell out what we would like to see included in the preparation of the fuel poverty strategy. And a lot of work has already been done on this by both the strategic working group, which Elizabeth provided the secretariat for, and the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force. Um, 
which the Scottish Government convened, which I chaired. So I think there is a lot of information available. But can I make the simple point that I think a very useful way of ensuring that the strategy delivers for remote rural Scotland uh, is to make sure that it is islands proofed in, uh, uh, as per the requirements of the Islands uh, Scotland Act, um, which I think is all but um, um, in, in, in place now. I think it's got a few small stages to go. But it seems to me that, that uh, the minister, uh, Mr. Stewart, has um, previously indicated that he would be happy to see uh, the, the the bill and the strategy island proofed, as I understand it, as soon as possible. And I would urge the committee to support that view because I think it would be useful for making sure that both the bill and the strategy do what they are required to do in practice. A couple of points. First, on um, the consultation requirements, which we welcome the specific reference to getting the views of people with lived experience of fuel poverty, which we think is quite positive. We think that should also happen in, um, in terms of gathering their views on reporting you know, progress. Uh, and that the consultation should be more in terms of co-design rather than just, you know, a passive, you know, asking asking for some some input and and wrap in feedback. We've got some extensive comments on that aspect. But secondly, on the on the content, um, similar to comments I've said earlier about you know business as usual, does the strategy actually contain you know specific policies or programs that are different from what we have now? You know, we should build on what we have now, which is which has been successful, but to have the step change towards accelerated progress, we think there should be new programs, policies using levers of you know either regulation or incentive or looking at issues um, to um, how we're making explicit links to other strategies like the child poverty strategy, like um, public health strategies. Those should be evidenced in in the fuel poverty strategy so that we know that, that that this will be mainstreamed across all of Scotland and not just the current pepper pot approach, which means, you know, if you're lucky, you might have a year-long project that's funded to provide the kinds of services that others were, were talking about, that hand-holding. Um, but if you're not lucky, well, you you don't have anything. So, so we think that we'd like to see the strategy developed so that it actually moves on from where we are today. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. I just, just wanted to very briefly add a point about the, the consultation requirements. It talks about the lived experience. Um, I think from a frontline worker perspective, we'd very much like to see frontline workers being consulted as well. Um, and that would perhaps give a, a good indication of the trigger points for when consumers do approach a trusted intermediary. So um, uh, organisations such as Energy Action Scotland, Home Energy Scotland, Energy Savings Trust, and obviously Citizens Advisors, already a vast wealth of knowledge. Um, and I'm quite sure that m many frontline workers working in those organisations would be more than happy to actually just pipe up and give their kind of experience of it as well. Greg, you wanted to come in. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. And uh, also, I think there's a lot of scope for uh, more detail on how the lived experience of fuel poverty is measured. And I think that needs to be uh, set out in more detail. There's a lot of options uh, of places that could be done. And as Linda said, uh, speaking to frontline workers is very important. There's also quite a lot of work already done through the um, Scottish Household Survey that could be expanded on to get more data on fuel poverty. Uh, and I think the strategy will need a lot more detail. It, it sets out a commitment on addressing all four drivers of fuel poverty. As I said before, we need a lot more detail on how that's going to be done. We've talked a lot today about uh, some of the limitations of Scottish government powers. And because of that, we need to understand what the strategy is going to... It needs to look in great detail about what it's going to do to do things like bring down energy prices and increase incomes. Um, so that's just that's an area I think it needs a lot more detail. The, the other aspect um, that uh, we had some thoughts on is uh, in terms of vulnerability criteria. There was a recommendation from the academic review panel about... Um, having ongoing work to uh, essentially, I suppose, define vulnerability or to uh, uh, produce a set of uh, criteria that would, um, you know, 
uh, uh, through things like health and disability that would be indicators of vulnerability. I think there would be benefit in the strategy if there was a clear commitment to uh, perhaps a, a, a permanent panel of, of uh, uh, public health experts or something like that that would uh, review that on an ongoing basis because we know vulnerability is a comp complex issue. It's something that changes a lot uh, over time for society and for individuals. And so I think that's ongoing work that needs to be reviewed. And as that work is being reviewed, I think that the suggestion in the strategy that the age of 75 as an assumed age for requiring an enhanced heating regime, which I think is very closely related to the vulnerability question, that age is potentially too high because vulnerability is not just a health issue. Uh, after retirement age, we have people becoming more uh, financially vulnerable, spending more time at home. The same goes for people with children under under five. So uh, in our view, it would be, I think, until at least that first uh, stage of work in terms of uh, setting out those vulnerability criteria, it would be beneficial to include households with children under five and to bring that age of assumed uh, requirement for an enhanced heating regime in line with uh, the pension age. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Andy, you have a couple of questions towards the end. Yeah? Yes, I just wanted to return to <clears throat> the financial memorandum. Um, Elizabeth Layton, you correctly identified that the financial memorandum uh, merely reflects the costs of implementing the bill itself, the printing a strategy and how much time that will take to write it and all the rest of it. Um, and I think you highlight other pieces of legislation like climate change targets where we have a more detailed um, cost of achieving um, the target. Can any of you say a little bit more about, given that we can assess the full cost of achieving this target, that would be unreasonable, what can we reasonably, what should we expect uh, can reasonably be done to assess the broad costs of eradicating fuel poverty according either to this bill as it stands or according to any amended target we might have? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll head off on that. The, in our evidence, we suggested that there actually could be some projections made of what the costs would be. Certainly, um, we gave some examples of research that's been done on the energy efficiency side um, that been done over the last few years by Consumer Futures, as formerly um, what now has become CAS, uh, where they have estimated costs of alleviating fuel poverty in that case. So, it, so it's an example of, of how those projections could be done and give an indication of what, what it would cost to achieve, for example, just the Energy Efficient Scotland accelerated targets for fuel poor homes. And those figures indicated that at least, at least a doubling of the current annual budget for energy efficiency and fuel poverty programs has to be made available. And I stress at least because it's only looking at one driver and it is the research is a little bit dated. Um, so, you know, you need to call. And I think in speaking with, for example, public health officials and consulting with frontline workers, it would be possible to project how do we address the other drivers as well. So I wouldn't say it's unreasonable to do a, to do a projection, an estimate of what the costs would be, as they have done with the climate change plan and, and with the climate change bill. And importantly, the other aspect they did was they looked at the wider benefits of action on climate change. The same could be done for fuel poverty. Those arguments are well rehearsed. The benefits in terms of health, well-being, jobs for the economy, improved energy security, and of course, energy savings in people's pockets, which then get spent in the local economy. Again, there's been research in all of those areas, and that could be documented to evidence why investment in this is, is well worthwhile, and again, you know, look again, are there other government budgets that could contribute to this effort? Okay. Mr. Okay. Alexander. Um, just to put on the record uh, that the Highlands Lands Housing Association's affordable warmth group um, uh, drew up a proposal um, um, some time ago now um, um, for an energy, what we call an energy carer um, uh, based model of delivery. Uh, which I've described in my previous answers, um, 
and um, so that exists. The Scottish Government never formally responded to it. The proposal was also picked up and advocated by the Scottish Government's Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force. So there is work out there which gives a detail of the, what it would cost to deliver the kind of outreach service, personalised outreach service, which is required to tackle the problems in the Highlands and Islands. Thank you. Um, Very much. Another question we kind of skipped over is the question of um, monitoring. Uh, coming again to the Climate Change Act, we have the Independent Committee for Climate Change that produces reports um, and is a statutory advisor to, to, to government and is independent. Um, in the bill in section six, um, the periodic reports are to be prepared by Scottish ministers uh, and laid before parliament. Um, in your evidence, I think all of you say something about enhanced reporting and scrutiny to help future parliamentarians, future policymakers assess whether we're on track, as it were. And I think, Craig, you had mentioned about reporting that focused on each of the individual drivers. Um, so, I mean, any brief comments you have about that? We have your written evidence, obviously, but any brief comments you have about that and how important you think that might be would be useful. On you go, Mr. Alexander, then, Craig. Um, uh, very important, and very important that the major reviews are done um, uh, uh, sooner rather than later. In other words, five years from start counting now, basically, or from 2019, so in 2024 29, to reiterate the point about the requirement for interim re reports, annual reporting, so that you can keep proper tabs on what's really happening and try and avoid repeating the problem of the previous fuel poverty strategy, which is that you're always looking back at things getting not really improving very much and not very, it, it appeared as if, you know, not, not enough that was really effective was being done to alter the direction of travel. Uh, uh, Mr. Salt, I'll yourself. Yeah, uh, just briefly, I think it would be beneficial to have a statutory rule for a third party organisation to uh, to carry out that monitoring and to produce you know, frequent reports that do set out progress on each of the four drivers. Uh, and I say each of the four drivers, I mean each of the recognised drivers, because obviously they could change over time. But um, I think that would uh, give a more robust level of scrutiny, as you say, as with the, the, the Committee on Climate Change. Um, I think there should also be a, a benefit for ministers to uh, uh, be required to respond to that report in Parliament um, and to, again, respond on each of the drivers of fuel poverty. And I think that is important to make sure that we aren't just focusing on one aspect of fuel poverty, that there is a statutory um, uh, requirement, essentially, to at least measure and look at each driver, even if not even if that uh, ends up being the case that not every driver can be uh, 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 tackled to the same extent. We need to understand why that is and we need to understand where the sticking points are. So I think that would be beneficial. Yeah. Very briefly, can get the Home Energy Conservation Act, which was introduced in 95 and 96, required local authorities to report every two years on progress towards their statutory targets. And the reason for that um, was to allow um, just that scrutiny of progress and then, if needed, amend the target, give guidance and change. If we're talking about every five years, that seems far too long to allow significant change or guidance to be given within that. Because if we do it every five years and then we take a year to publish, that runs into to six years. So the information you've got is already five years behind because of that. The House Condition Survey models every year continually now. The House Condition Survey used to be every five years. It models every year and becomes statistically valid every three years, although they put out figures every year. So there is already a precedent in terms of gathering that information and reporting to Parliament. Thank you. Elizabeth. Just, uh, just briefly to say we've, we've argued that the Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel should be established on a statutory base, so, basis so it is independent 
and is goes beyond one administration and can then respond to reports and provide advice to Parliament, but also that there should be not only annual reporting, short, shorter reports than a five-yearly annual reporting, but also that, that provides an opportunity to look at it, should there be any corrective action taken if progress isn't sufficient, but also to look at the resource question. Is it adequately resourced? So not just a strategy of you know, ideas and nice ideas and plans, but is it adequately resourced to deliver what it says it's going to do? And that's what's being done with the child poverty bill and also with the climate change bill. Uh, Andy, Graham wants to come in, then I'll come back to you. Yep. Okay, Graham. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, just want to uh, nip back to the, the, the strategy, um, which, is, uh, which is in part three of the bill. We've, this, this committee's been dealing with the, the planning bill um, as well, um, and there was an amendment went through which looked at the national planning framework and said that there should be an, an enhanced uh, parliamentary scrutiny uh, of that. Um, do you think that should also apply to the fuel poverty strategy? Um, in other words, that Parliament should have a, a, a greater role uh, in that. It shouldn't just be left to ministers just to publish it and show us it, and then we all move on. Briefest of answers, yes. yes. Yeah. I take it there's a unanimity there. Yes, right, OK. Good. I wish all the questions had been like that. <laughs> <laughs> Andy. Now, just a final little question. Um, the boring bits at the end of bills are often the most interesting. So section 13 is on commencement and section 14 tells us what the act is going to be called once it's enacted. And so the commencement section 13 says that this section, i.e. the commencement section, and section 14 come into force on the day after royal assent. In other words, when the Queen signs the bill and it becomes an act, all we've got is a name and the fact that that name comes into force on that day. Nothing else. Everything else waits for ministers to commence the rest of the bill, what will by then be an act, um, including, I think, some of you have, have talked about the need to commence Section 3. Um, so have any of you got any views on whether we should strengthen the commencement provisions to have a timetabling for doing this rather than just leaving it to ministers? If you don't have a view, that doesn't matter. You'd spoiled it. It was going so well. <laughs> Mr. Alexander, then. Yeah, I mean, I mean yes, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it does need a timetable, and uh, I think that many of the responses to the fuel poverty consultation document, rather than submissions to this committee um, earlier in the year, made that point. We need milestones, and we need uh, a much clearer way of understanding what is planned, and we need it sooner rather than later. In, the bill contains the milestones, but the trigger point for starting the clock ticking is in the gift of ministers in terms of commencing virtually the whole of the bill. So that's the question I'm asking. The, the, the triggering, should we, um, should we be looking at setting some of those dates like in the bill, like for a year after royal assent, we shall trigger, etc.? the words out of my mouth. We were uh, suggesting a, a 12 months from from the date of the um, royal assent, and we think that would be reasonable as we have a draft strategy already in our hands, and and so a 12-month timetable would would ensure that it doesn't languish. I don't think the Scottish government in any way intends to do that, but it would give assurance that um, the momentum will be maintained. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Graham. You wanted to come in with one last point. Well, if it's the final question, convener, um, the, the bill it, it's an incredibly flimsy document. Um, if, if we didn't have it, would anyone lose out? Yes, I think is the, the simple answer to that, because we then have nothing to say what we would like to do. We have an energy efficiency programme that will trundle on to no end. Um, we'll simply continue to provide some uh, help to people will not know how effective it is. I think the bill helps to bring that into focus. Um, I think we can all, on this side of the table, disagree with um, the uh, 2040 date, but it does lay out what it what it is, uh, intends to achieve. And I think if we don't have that, then there is no focus for future work or programmes. Okay. 
Right. Okay. And on that note, unless anybody's got any last comments they would like to, to ask. Linda. Yeah, I just wanted to say I prepared um, two case studies, um, which I'll leave with you. But um, the point in preparing them was to give two different examples of people in fuel poverty, one of which we worked very closely with to bring her out of fuel poverty. She was in a local authority property and uh, had plenty of options. The other case study is actually for a lady who has worked very, very hard to be energy efficient. Um, she's engaged with two um, separate programmes, Warmer Home Scotland for external wall insulation and historically the Green Deal, which I know is reserved to Westminster. She is now in fuel poverty despite that work, and I have got no strategies left to pull her out of it other than time and a hope for a change of circumstances. So the point of including that one is to show, you know, for the 5% target, there will still some be, be some people who just can't move out of that. So I'll, I'll leave them here for your perusal, if you don't mind. Yeah, that very Thank much. You. That's very Yes, yeah, so I was just going to pick up on the the question of does it does it make any difference? And you know certainly you know I, we do welcome it, although we have said it you know it needs a lot more in it. It's only we've used the term half a bill. Uh, we've given a list of you know a starter list, if you like, of of additional amendments that could be made or areas for amendment where it could be supplemented so that we're actually putting in place the the relevant powers or the um, commitments that would mean that we're we're moving on from where we are we're putting we're removing the barriers and creating the opportunities to um, be more ambitious on eradicating fuel poverty across all the drivers i'd say it's not a complete list but it does give some examples of where this bill could make a difference if it is amended thank you very much and on that note i would like to thank you for your time and uh, your very useful answers today and I'm going to suspend the meeting briefly to allow you to leave the table. Thank you.